Today's episode of the podcast is brought to you by Eccentric, the makers of the K-Box and the new K-Pulley. Guys, flywheel training's really grown in popularity of late, and although it's something that's been around for a while, the simple reason that it's grown in popularity is because it works. We've been lucky to have a K-Box in our weight room for the past three years, and we've seen some really great things when it comes to improving the athlete's ability to change direction, and then looking at our return to play protocols with different lower body injuries with the student athletes. The love-hate relationship that everyone has with the K-Box is now just going to grow more with the addition of the K-Pulley. The ability to do standing presses, pulls, rip-throughs, and knee drive exercises is just going to be another arsenal to our training and another addition to the love-hate relationship that our student-athletes have with the awesome tools that come from Eccentric. Go ahead and hop over to Eccentric.com today to check out what they have. Guys, I can't recommend it enough, and I guarantee you won't be disappointed not just with the products, but with the awesome customer service that Eccentric provides. Hey, everybody. If you enjoy the podcast and the content that it provides, make sure you hop over and check out the all-new Strength Coach Network. The Strength Coach Network is a combination of the CVA SPS community and the Rugby Strength Coach community, bringing you what is sure to be the Internet's leading resource for continuing education for strength and conditioning professionals. Combining these two resources has allowed us to bring some of the best content from some of the best minds in the world together for your one-stop shop to better improve the continuing education for not just yourself, but your entire staff. Bringing together all of the lectures from the Rugby Strength Coach community, along with the lectures exclusively done for the Central Virginia Sport Performance community, and all the lectures performed at the Central Virginia Sport Performance Seminar, make this an absolute must for performance coaches around the world. The world-class lectures at the Strength Coach Network are not all that you'll see as well. The discussion in the forums and the support and the career guidance from some of the top practitioners in the world, from people all over the world, makes this an absolute must and a great place for you to network, learn, and grow as a performance professional. So hop on over to strengthcoachnetwork.com and use the code CVASPS, that's C-V-A-S-P-S, to get your 48-hour trial for only a dollar. We're sure you're going to find great value in the Strength Coach Network and are really excited to have you involved. So hop on over to strengthcoachnetwork.com and use the code CVASPS to check it out today. Hello and welcome to the podcast. Today, guys, we have an absolutely sensational talk, talking international cricket with Rob Amon. Rob is going to get right into it, talking about you know, the, the huge trip that they're on right now, going from Great Britain down to India. We're going to get into how the travel has impacted not just their training and preparation, but looking at how they've handled travel nutritionally, how they're looking at jet lag, how they're looking at recovery, and how they're building the guys to be ready for their first match, which was seven days after landing. We also spend a good portion of the talk, guys, talking about how he evaluates these athletes, how this, these evaluations then drive the training, how that evaluation also drives discussion with the athletes so they can have autonomy in the training, and how it all ties back together with how he works with not just the athlete, but the athlete's uh, club coach so that they can then seemingly roll right back in when this tour comes to an end into the club scene. This is really an awesome talk, guys. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Let's get right to it. Rob, thank you so much for spending the time with us today. No problem, Jay. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be. It's a pleasure to come along, to be honest, and be invited along. Yeah, man. Well, I'm really happy that we can make this work. I mean, it's allegedly talking with someone on the other side of the world can be a challenge, I hear. But let's catch everybody up with where you're at like right now, how you got to where yep. you're at right now and, and what you got going with the boys over there. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm currently head of strength and conditioning for the England and Wales cricket board. Um, and I'm currently in Southern India in Kerala. Um, so I'm on tour with the, with the England lions, which is the A team. It's the team below the kind of men's team. Um, we've got a five week tour out here, uh, a play in tour where we play India A and India are one of the best uh, best teams in the world up there with us, so it's going to be a really tough competition. Um, but I haven't always been the uh, England S&C coach, so I've had quite a quite a long time in cricket. I probably started back in 2000 with a university team where it was a bit more kind of sports science support, where I was asked to kind of test the lads, retest, and then 
people start asking me the right training programs, which I do, and they start seeing some changes. And before you know it, I'm kind of getting picked up by the local cricket team. Um, so I start working with the academy, then I start working with the pro team. And I spent on the pro, working with the pro cricketers in UK. And then I kind of started moving towards England. Uh, and I got picked up to move a lot to work with the pathway team. So that's working from the uh, England and the 19s and then Lions and men. Um, and I've now progressed to the head of head of strength and conditioning for England cricket. So it's been a bit of a journey, um, but it's been it's been a good journey. Um, learned a lot along the way. I love it, and especially because you you went through the ranks, and yeah, I don't know if this is really the way to say it, but you did it the right way, moving up from the developmental squad into the full team. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I I think that's probably stood me in quite good stead, to be honest. Um, some of the lads who are playing the, for the men's team, the international game at the minute, then. You know, I've worked with those for, for quite a number of years. So you've actually got some really, really strong relationships. And not only that, I mean, part of my role is I have to liaise with the kind of other pro teams in the UK. And, you know, I've, I know all the other S&C coaches who've been around for, for a while. And, I, you know, you've had one or two on, on your show. You, you interviewed Daz Van S a couple of weeks ago and Chris Toombs. And both of, both of those guys I've worked with quite closely for a number of years. Um, so, yeah, coming up through the ranks definitely helps. And, you know, you learn a lot about the game and, the culture within the game and what the lads like and don't like and how the coaches go about things. Um, yes, yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely been educational. Sensational. And, it, and looking at your situation now, it, it's pretty unique because mm. one, you guys just took that little trip from, from the Island down there to India. And yeah. two, you're in the middle of the international season, which is going to lead into the club season. Yeah, absolutely. So, so let's talk about how you're handling all of this yeah. because that's a lot on somebody's plate. Yeah. So um, yeah, we've just uh, we just started. Um, so no, let, let, let me go back a sec. Um, yeah, we've just flown out to Kerala um, and we've just landed um, and we're here for a five week tour. But the tricky part of this is that we've had we've just come off the back of a Christmas break where we've had to shut the lads well the lads shut down for Christmas they don't really do too much but we've had to keep the lads training and working hard because we know that if they do come out on a five week tour that things can be pretty tricky um, so yeah we had a long long flight from the UK where we flew into Abu Dhabi and then kind of flew on so we missed a kind of a de- probably about a night's sleep um, and we're playing within uh, seven days of landing so. Um, yeah, kind of the getting the training process right in the first couple of days at tour is massively important, uh, just to make sure the lads get up to speed. Um, but like you said, Jay, there's we've got some real competing demands going on at the minute because yes, it's international season, but when the lads get back to the UK, uh, they go into the club season. So uh, one of my big jobs at the minute is to manage one the in-season training loads or the in-competition training loads, but also to make sure the lads are fully prepped going into their own county and, and domestic season. Um, cause their coaches wouldn't be too happy if they turned up and not in, not in good shape. So, um, I'm, there's a big juggling, juggling act at the minute between, you know, stimulating them enough to create some adaptation, but not stimulating them too much where I'm going to kind of make them tired and, uh, potentially upset, uh, upset the preparation for the games. Yes. And looking at that, then there's gotta be a lot of communication going between you and these club coaches. Yeah, it's a huge amount of communication, yeah. Um, I mean, before the lads turn up for the tour, we'll sit down, we'll talk with the coaches about where they, how they present physically, and we'll actually fitness test them ourselves, and we'll get a good good idea of where they are. And then we'll just, you know, we, we know what the demands of tours are. We know we'll play, say, five games in nine days. Um, and if you kind of look at, there's some kind of published GPS stuff at the minute where during a one-day game, a cricket player will cover maybe 12 to 15K, so some of these lads are going to cover a serious amount of distance over these nine days. So that's why we kind of fitness test and start with get a rough idea of where they are. And then we know which kind of which physical qualities they need to work on when they're with us to help them get through this this train this competitive block. Then also to improve their improve their uh, their, cap- their capabilities and capacities when they go back to their kind of domestic seasons. So let's talk about how you're evaluating these guys because that's something that you know. It, People like to compare cricket to baseball, and I think looking yeah. at the, the energy, I mean, it's they're nothing alike. You guys play games for like five days in a row, but we can get into that later. Yeah. Um, how do you evaluate that? And then you also brought up GPS and tracking and athlete mm. monitoring with that. 
how does that tracking piggyback what you're doing when you're looking at the evaluations? Okay. So if I go into the evaluation side of things first, um, we've got uh, my kind of main aim when I look at a cricketer is I want them kind of lean and running robust. Um, should, like I said, the GPS figures, they, you know, worst case scenario in a kind of five day game, a player could cover in those five days somewhere up to 50 K, uh, which is a huge amount of, it's a huge distance. It's, yeah, you know, it's, there's not many other sports like it. Um, so from much from my point, they, their body composition needs to be as optimal as possible because if they're carrying their skin folds are too high, they're carrying extra weight. And then we start thinking about the ground reaction forces that they go through just in running. That's a huge amount of extra extra load going through the body. Um, it just means they're inefficient. Um, and they're probably not going to cope with the mileage that they that they need to cope with. So for me, some of the main evaluation tests we look at, we definitely look at body composition. They're using the sum of eight sites. Uh, we'll go for the yo-yo test for everybody or the 2K time trial as a measure of aerobic capacity and aerobic power. Um, but then, like, uh, like I said earlier, we've got two distinct kind of playing groups, if you like. We've got a batting, a batting group and a bowling group. And for me, batters, we look at things like change of direction. So we'll do kind of 505 pro agility or a cricket-specific test called the run two. Um, and then we'll also look at things like rotational power. But with the bowlers, it'll be slightly differently. So we'll look at a bit more of their lower body strength capabilities. We'll look at their trunk strength. And then we'll look at just their technical efficiency running. Because these are the guys, these are the real workhorses. These are the guys who will cover the biggest distances, you know, overall, as well as the kind of biggest distances at kind of tw above 20 Ks an hour. Um, so those guys really need some real tight running mechanics and be able to absorb huge amounts of forces. Fantastic. Can you, can you get into what this specific test is, though, for, for cricket? That, that's really intriguing to me. The run two, yeah, so... Cricket pitch is 17.6 meters long. Um, um, one of the things that happens in games is the, the batter will hit the ball and they'll obviously run up and back as well. So, but you can run one, two, three, four, five runs, depending on how many you want to get to. But for us, we tend to test run twos. So it's, it's a bit like your 505 or your pro agility test, but it's just done over a slightly longer distance. So you sprint up to the top, to the top crease, turn and sprint back again. Um, so you're covering a total distance of 34 meters. Um, for me, a good time over that over that run two would be sub six seconds, uh, which is which is good. Anything below six seconds, you know, you've got a you know you've got a, a decent athlete on your hands. Um, but then within that cricket specific test, you know, the lads will do it with the bats with a bat in hand as well, and they also run with pads on. Um, but in within that test, we can look at different things. So we can look at their kind of turning ability. Uh, so we'll measure their their 505 time. So that time that they, which gives us an indication of how well they turn. Um, if that time is nice and low, it means they've got a good, good turning and good technical turning ability. Whereas if that time is quite high, then it's, you start asking some questions as to, do they need to improve their relative strength to help them with these 180 degree turns? Or do they need some, some technical coaching interventions on their actual turning ability? Um, and then we can kind of delve deeper down a rabbit hole to kind of look, right, what do we actually need to do to make these guys the best cricket athletes that they can possibly be. I love it. And that I love how that can drive training in such a simple manner, but make it so precise as to what these specific yeah. guys need. Absolutely. That's what I'm all about, Jay, to be honest. It's kind of using the data that you collect effectively to make these guys the best athletes that they can possibly be and the best cricket athletes. I think when I probably started out, I was probably thinking about making these guys just better athletes and chasing numbers in the weight room and out on the track. But as I kind of progressed and been around this sport a long time, I know that cricketers, then they haven't got the reputation to be good athletes. But what you know, when you sit down and work with the coaches, they want better cricketers and better cricket athletes. So it's about giving them ability to, to make sure they can keep doing their job for longer and keep doing that job better. And if I can do that, then, you know, you're going to get a, a good outcome, not from just from them, but you'd also get good, good buy-in from the coaches as well. Totally. Because the more that you're giving them what they need, the better they're going to buy into what you're providing. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. That's, that's exactly, that's, that's the way it should be. It shouldn't just be about me writing a training program based on what I think is right for them. It should be a two-way conversation as in, what do you want to do? What do you want to work on? This is what I see you need to work on. We're, and then let's come to some compromise and push on from there. 
you know, some of the lads, it will be slightly different. You probably have to compromise a little bit more. Some of them then what they want to work on will probably match up with what you want to see as well, which is happy days. So it's, um, yeah, it always has to be that two way process. You can't kind of, you can't dive into it and think that you know how it feels to play cricket um, and what that individual needs. You have to kind of engage them in that whole, in that whole process. A thousand percent with that because autonomy is so important now, especially as we get into this next generation, their input is so valuable to them when it comes to providing yeah, insight. Abs- absolutely. Yeah. That's where, that's, uh, yeah. One of my big things is that kind of self-determination theory where, you know, the autonomy around the training program, how the players relate to it and how they can actually control some of the choices within that training program as well. You know, if we want to develop some, some really good intrinsically motivated athletes, then that we need they need to, have to to experience that autonomy and relatedness and control. Otherwise, they're not doing it for the right reasons. They're just doing it because they want to try and impress the coach or try and impress somebody else. And do you know what? That won't lead to a long career. If you're doing things for the intrinsic reasons, that will that'll push you on and that will give you that long career where you go off and earn a lot of money. Yes. Now, going back on these evaluations and all of that, mm. how do those tie into how you're monitoring the, the athletes? So there's a couple of ways we go about it. So uh, of the, all the bowlers will wear GPS units. Um, and that just, so and we look at, I've got a couple of key metrics that I look, that I look at and use regularly with those guys. Um, main one being total distance. I also cover, I also look at meters uh, covered above 20K an hour because you know that that total load, if you like, the total distance covered gives you a good indication of the volume of work that they've done. So in but then the meters above 20 Ks an hour gives you a, a good indication of the intensity of the work they've done. Uh, and I think those two kind of parameters together with a couple of other little clever parameters that the GPS gives you gives me a really good indication of, of the work that those players have done within those games. Um, and one of the things we do with it is we've actually started to build up a nice little database now of what uh, a, a typical game looks like. So if we're trying to condition our athletes to, to get them ready for game performance, we know that during a one-day game, for example, they might cover 2,500 metres above 20K an hour. So if I want to get my bowlers prepped for that, for a one-day game, I need to know that they can cover 2,500 metres above 20K an hour. So it actually gives me some, some, some performance uh, implications of the, the GPS data. That's one of the things with the GPS that I think that might be a little underutilized too is looking at actual performance metrics as to how the training may be positively or negatively impacting them. Yeah, definitely. I think so as well. Um, and one of the things we have seen is that, especially with the, the fast bowlers, is those guys with the better, better aerobically conditioned definitely cover more meters per minute in the kind of high intensity periods during the game. Um, we've got a little bit of good data kind of supporting that. So, yeah, the performance metrics definitely need to be looked at. Yes, 100%. So now let's talk about this little voyage you've taken and how you're going to handle the guys over there because you guys play so many matches so often that, you know, when talking with Daz about this a couple of weeks ago, like the training aspect blows my mind how you're you're able to do anything, but even more so with, with what you guys are doing with the national team right now, how are you looking at not just training, but how you're getting the guys back each day, the, the recovery modalities or nutritionally how yeah. you're handling them? Yeah. So if you take, take the training option first or training point first, um, obviously when we got off the plane, the first day after getting off the plane was, you know, just acclimatized to, <laughs> to 35 degrees and 65% humidity because in the UK it's probably about seven degrees at the minute. Um, but I've got a kind of standardized uh, build-up that I kind of tend to use after the lads get off planes um, just to make sure they get into the kind of right frame, right physical place. So kind of day one tends to be some acceleration work just to kind of help get some acceleration work back into their body and get the hamstrings prepped. Day two tends to be a strength session. Day three tends to be endurance. And then we, well, I know once they've kind of ticked those three units off that we're kind of almost in a good, in a good place to play. Um, but what we always do, or what I always do, is two days out from a game, so yeah, D minus two from a game, they always get a, a, that's their kind of key day, the big strength day, if you like, as well as a big kind of skills day. 
then the day before the game, D minus uh, yeah, D minus one, the lads will do a sprint session. So probably real low volume sprint session, maybe four to six 40 meter sprints max, depending on on the individual, um, just to make sure that hamstring conditioning stays on top. And they're also kind of just maintaining that kind of regular dose of the speed work. So we know the residuals of, of speed kind of they, you know, speed declines pretty quick. So for me, the more we can kind of the more we can keep micro dosing that, if you like, the better the better the capacities will be. Um, so that kind of leads them into a game, if you like, day strength two days out, sprint the day before, and then play the game. Um, and when the game's on, then that's pretty much it. The game takes care of itself. Um, but my kind of big role during the game is kind of then looking after them nutritionally. Um, we do have a nutritionist with us. Uh, unfortunately, she's not with us on this trip, but she's spoken to the lads previously. But we've got a couple of practices that we kind of put in place. So all the boys will weigh in and weigh out kind of post, post games just so we can kind of monitor fluid, fluid loss and hydration status. Um, you know, the thing we do as well is that we make sure the food is tailored at lunch. So lunch times, we make sure they get some, you know, balanced kind of carb, protein, fat meal just on board so they can, they can kind of go off and play the second half. And not only that, at the end of the kind of innings, then we'll, we can use protein shakes, um, creating, we can use that. We, they, we've got a, a range of supplements that we can kind of give the lads to, to kind of help them recover. Um, and for me, there's a couple of real simple rules. It's kind of fluids, food, and hydration. So as soon as the lads are finishing, finishing playing, is get the fluids down and get the food down them, and kind of go to bed as well. Um, you know, sleep is probably one of the most underused recovery tools out there. So it's kind of get an early light and kind of go look to go again. And then how did that sleep now with, I mean, we all know how important it is and just mm. for some reason, all of a sudden people like to talk about how it's important, but how did losing that day impact all of those things that you just mentioned? Yeah. It had a, it probably caught a few people out by surprise. Um, yeah, there was, Day one and day two, the lads were pretty flat coming into the practices in the morning. They were, I'm tired. I'm not sure if I, you know, I'm not sure if I can do this speed session. I'm not sure if I want to do this skill session because they were just so tired. They, you know, it, their body clock was still working on pretty much UK time and they, they missed the night's sleep. So, um, yeah, it really, really caught some of them out. But, you know, thankfully, having done a number of these tours, you kind of, I'm aware of this kind of this happening but then it's just about how you actually go about trying to reset the lads and bring their emotional state back to somewhere where you want them so instead of them kind of moping around and thinking oh, I'm, I'm not ready to train just kind of play a few games with them have some fun with them kind of raise the kind of emotional level up a little bit and kind of raise make them a little bit happier and then then training kind of started taking care of itself that's awesome and it Building that rapport and that positive energy and, and that is an interesting tactic. So is that something that you guys utilize often when it comes to the uh, the jet lag issues that, that you can see with these huge flights that are required for the sport? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, without a doubt. I mean, for me, it's all about the rapport with the players. I mean, the days where you've got to ask them to do some pretty ugly things and they are pretty tired. Um, if you haven't got a good rapport with them, the likelihood of them, of them going, to, going off and doing that is it's nowhere near as, as high as what it would be if you have got a decent rapport with them. So, you know, one of my main main things is when I meet a new group of lads or they meet some new players is just try and develop a rapport with those guys straight away to make sure that when we do come to tricky times and I have to ask them to do things that it becomes a bit easier to kind of to ask them, ask them, can you go off and get the session done? Can you go off and get your speed done? Can you go off and put, get your endurance done in 35 degree heat? You know, they may not want, always want to do that, but if you've got a good rapport with them and they, they all work for you, then that definitely makes things a lot easier. You know, and the other thing that you guys dealt with and you brought it up twice now is, you know, this, this massive, fluctuation in climate and this is something mm. that we see with a lot of our fall sports where you know you'll have kids like say that play field hockey that are coming down to Virginia or North Carolina in August after being in Pennsylvania for the past three months and, and making a massive temperature increase and the humidity increase what are some things that you guys are doing to prep the guys for that and what are some things that you're doing to help them 
acclimate better when they get there. Yeah, a couple of things we've done previously is um, we're quite lucky in the training facility we've got in the UK where we can actually turn the temperature up inside the training facility. So we can ramp the temperature up inside the training hall to about 35 degrees and that can run all day. So we can actually get the lads training in temperatures that they're, close, that they're probably going to experience. Um, so that, that, that definitely helps. Um, we've also used in the past uh, heat chambers where we've actually gone through an acclimation process. So we'll take we, uh, the main the men's team have gone into kind of heat chambers and performed you know a couple of thirty minute cycles in gradually increasing heat, and that's definitely helped with the acclimation process as well. Um, so yeah, there are a couple of key strategies that we use to get the lads ready for for the heat. Um, and when we're out here, it's just about managing about managing the heat stress. Then so there's a number of things we do. We use the ice towels to kind of help keep them cool. So if they're not doing anything. And they've or they've just finished doing something, then it's get a heat towel on your back or get a cold drink down you. You know, there's some real, real easy strategies to help help keep you cool. Um, and if you're not doing anything, get out of the sun. Yeah, I think that last one might be the one that's most overlooked often. Like, yeah, definitely. I, th- I think people stand out in it way too often sometimes. And you know, they finish and they're watching other, watching other people practicing. Where you know, what you need to do is if you were trying to recover is get your body temperature down so get out of the sun a little bit get, get some cool cool drinks down here and start the recovery process as soon as possible yeah and we all know that the sun can wear you down i mean especially if you're going from a lovely uk winter day to what is probably close to summer down there right yeah it is getting close to summer yeah the temperature is going up daily to be honest so could That's be 40 a, degrees by the end of the trip. Boy, yeah, that'll, yeah. Be, that'll be rough for the boys. Yeah, that will be rough for the lads. Yeah. Well, it's awesome. So, listen, Rob, let me get you out of here on this. Where, where can people find more about you, what you're doing, and, and, and learn more about how you're doing things with, with the, the team up there in England? Yeah, well, I'm on, on Instagram, and I'm also on, tw- on Twitter as well. Uh, I think my Twitter handle is... Rob Arman. Um, so if anybody wants to, you know, hit me up with uh, an email or check out, uh, I, I do post quite regularly. Um, as, and as you I do with the lads as well, probably go onto, onto my Instagram account or my, or my Twitter account. Um, so yeah, if anybody wants to uh, get a look, then by all means get a look. Um, and there's also the ECB website, uh, ecb.co.uk, which there's always pictures and, and articles on there of some of the work that we do. Absolutely awesome. Rob, I can't thank you enough for spending the time with us today, man. This is sensational. Cool. Thanks, Jay. Pleasure. Thank you very much. Yeah, man. Hey, listen, kick butt down there. Safe travels back to England, and we'll be in touch real soon, brother. Yeah, cool. Thanks, Jay. Take care, bro. Yeah, man. Cheers. Thank you. And a huge thanks to Rob Almond for spending the time with us today. Guys, open, honest, candid sharing, a man breaking down everything he's doing with some of the best athletes in the world, sharing with us how he's looking at things, how they're evaluating the guys, how they're moving forward, and how he's working in conjunction across lines when it comes to the international team and the club teams. Rob, I can't thank you enough for being so open, honest, and candid and spending the time with us today. This is sensational. Keep up the great work, brother. Truly appreciate all that you're doing. And as always, guys, if you did enjoy the talk, please share it through the social media outlet of your choice, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, whatever it may be. As always, we're just trying to get the best information out there to all the great coaches that we can. And as always, guys, thank you for everything that you do for us here at Central Virginia Sport Performance. We will be back next week with another awesome guest. We will see you then.